right, I am really excited to introduce our next speaker, Hillary Mason. She is the general manager of machine learning at Cloudera. Previously, she founded Fast Forward Labs, which was acquired by Cloudera in 2017. Cloudera Fast Forward Labs is an advising and research service that applies emerging machine learning techniques to practical business problems. Hillary is a data scientist in residence at Accel Partners and is on the board of the Anita Borg Institute. The Anita Borg Institute is focused on connecting, inspiring, and guiding women in, commuting and in computing and organizations that view technology innovation as a strategic imperative. Formerly, she co-founded HackNY.org, a nonprofit that helps engineering students find opportunities in New York's creative technical economy. She served on Mayor Bloomberg's Technology Advisory Council and was the chief scientist at Bitly. Hillary can be reached on Twitter at HMason and on LinkedIn. And before I bring her up, another fun fact. Uh, when she was just four years old, she told her mother that she wanted to be three things. She wanted to be an astronaut, a computer programmer, or, and or a taxi driver. And she still wants to be two of those things today. Let's bring up to the stage Hillary Mason. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me OK? All right, while uh, slide magic is happening, I would really love to get a better sense of who is in this giant room. So how many folks here are data scientists? Of course, now I can't see you because of these bright lights. But I think that was like 40-ish percent. All right, how many people here are on the business side of technology? All right. How many people here do product or entrepreneurs sort of thinking about? Very few. All right, what do the rest of you do? <laughs> data engineers. OK, I meant data science as a broad umbrella. How many data engineers? All right, got it. OK, and how many software engineers? A lot. OK, so that's, that's the, the group of us in the room. All right. So when they invite you to give a keynote, maybe you do or don't know this, you kind of get to pick what you talk about. Um, and I thought it would be really fun to use this space and hopefully no more than 30 minutes of your time to think a little bit about the practice of data science, machine learning, data engineering, and the products we build, and the interplay between those two things. Um, and so I called the talk the future, but it's really about the present and how we shape the present to get to the future I think we want to get to. Um, and I'm going to start by saying good morning. I know this has been a long session. I hope you've all had your coffee. Uh, I'm going to go really fast. Um, and I want to challenge a few ideas because I think that when we talk about AI, um, and we'll get to the specific vocabulary in a minute, we often are making this assumption that it's something coming or it's something in the future and it's new and it's shiny. But the reality is that it is actually everywhere already. We're all using these kinds of systems. We're using statistical models. We're using software tools every day. And we have been for 30 to 40 years um, that do this. And we just take them for granted. So if you think about things like your email spam filter, in fact, how often do you even think about it? It's there in the background doing its job. It is an AI product. It's something we use every day and don't really think about. And so for those of us who are, are giving talks or if you're out there you know, thinking about what you're going to build with this set of technologies, I think today our responsibility is not to get people excited about it, but to try to make it boring again, by which I mean we need to make it useful. That is, stop focusing on AI for the sake of AI and start focusing on the impact of the things we can actually build. Now, before I can actually convince you of this, let's talk about what makes a great AI data product. And this remains my favorite one. This is Google Maps Traffic View. I've never worked for Google. Um, so I don't have any like, incentive to promote this other than the fact that I have huge affection for it. And I'll tell you why, um, because it's really boring. And what I mean by that is that anyone can use this product and make a decision. And again, I live in New York. I live in Brooklyn. I don't own a car. 
The idea that people are driving these giant death machines down the street, looking at their phone, making a decision about where to go and where not to go, based on this visualization of data, is incredible to me. And here, we're in Boston, so you all can appreciate one-way streets that don't connect and like uh, lots of weird traffic that's unevenly distributed. And if you make a wrong turn, you're 15 minutes late because that's the way it works here. I know how to walk from here to places I want to go, but I could not tell you how to drive because that's how Boston works. Um, and yet we have tools like this that can inform us and help us make those decisions without any understanding of the technical work that goes into this. You don't need to know that Google is pulling data down from everybody's phones, running Google Maps and Android. You don't need to know that they're using historical models and making predictions or that they're streaming all of this down to you over a cellular network, that they're visualizing it using a scheme like red is good and green is bad that all of us have grown up with and, and just intuitively understand. So that's a good data product. And when I think about talking about these things, we have to try to reduce it down to a definition so simple no one can argue with this. And I am sure in this room there are people who can argue with this, so let's take it to Twitter. I'm H. Mason. Um, but I'm trying to, to come up with something that's so essential uh, that it gives us a foundation to work from, and it's just that a data product is a product that can only exist because of the underlying analysis of some data asset. All right, and here's another one of my favorites, dark sky making weather predictions, and again, in Boston, you all will understand why this is important. All right, so this is really hard. I'm gonna share with you my favorite example of this going wrong. Now, my name is Hillary Mason. It's spelled Hillary with one L. Everybody spells it wrong now. The only complaint I have about Mrs. Clinton. And, uh, you know, there's a character actress named Hillary Mason spelled exactly the same way. She's British. She's dead. She's quite a bit older than me. She had a wonderful career. Um, and because, you know, I share this name with her, a few weird things have cropped up over the years. So in 2009, a personal example, um, a really cool startup, which was actually called Cool, C-U-I-L, maybe some of the older folks in the room remember it, was going to be a Google killer with the key feature that it combined text results with pictures. This was new at the time. 2009 was a decade ago. Think back. Y'all are old enough to remember it. Um, but the problem was that that was my bio at the time. I was a professor, and this was the other Hillary Mason playing the role of ugly hag. This is the entity disambiguation problem. It is hard, okay? Unless you say, like, why are you making fun of some startup that's long out of business from a decade ago? It was just a hint of what was to come because we have our friends here at Bing, and this is, um, I don't remember when, probably around 2005. No, this was more recent than that, like 2012 or something. Um, and they rolled out, when they rolled out their, uh, you know, uh, celebrity box feature, they have a really grandiose name for it. Because clearly I don't belong there. <laughs> but um, Bing, by the way, does not get nearly enough credit for the quality of the data science work that goes into that product. It's a fantastic product. But if you look at this, by the way, do you get this, right? That is my photo, better haircut. Um, that is not my date of birth. I was not born in 1917, no matter how tired I may look this morning, and I am not dead, okay? Um, and I'm not an actor. I'm a computer scientist with a bit of a business hobby, right? And so, so here are some of the folks who are really, really good at this, and yet named entity recognition and disambiguation, still difficult. Unless you think our friends at Google are going to get out of jail free now that I said I love one of their products, I'm also going to make fun of them a little bit because that other Hillary Mason starred in a 1991 movie called Robot Jocks about giant robots punching other giant robots. So it's really awesome. And there is my photo, bottom right, um, snuck in there. And so, of course, I complained about this at the time on Google Plus because that was how you talk to nerds at Google. Um, and so they, they you know, made some changes, and I have lots of friends who work at Google and, and sort of got it sorted out. But then last year, I was giving a talk in, about entity disambiguation and specific industry applications of it, and I thought, hey, wouldn't it be funny to see where we stand? And there I was again, having snuck back in. Um, and so this is why it's fun. And I, I highlight this example because I think it's hilarious, but also because 
Um, even the people who are best in the world at this, some of whom may be in this room with us here today, so I hope you don't mind I'm gently making fun of you a bit, are not perfect. This is why data products and machine learning and AI is such an interesting place to be working right now, because it is not a solved problem, and what is possible is changing every day. All right, so let's talk about the words we use. And uh, if you look at the program for the event here, you'll see a lot of this terminology. Uh, I wanted to give you a framework for relating these things. And this is a diagram I usually use to explain this to executives. So you'll forgive me, but it's simple. Executives love pyramids. Um, just the visual works really well. But the point I'm trying to make here is that it, when we got together 10 years ago, uh, we were talking about big data, and that was really about the ability to build infrastructure to put all of your data in one place and count things in that data in a scalable way. That was it. But when you can count things, you can count things for a business purpose, and that gives you analytics, business intelligence. So the ability to count things at scale without a huge amount of overhead. And this was a fundamental transformation in the sense that it allowed companies to go from you know, reporting that would arrive as a PDF once a month to some sort of like close to real timey, if you consider it on the order of days or hours, real timey, uh, count of things that were actually happening uh, in the world that they cared about. And that was really, really useful. Don't discount it. Um, but then after you can count things, you can count things cleverly. You can start to predict things. And that's where data science fits. Right? So you start to model things, predict things. Um, that picked up about 10 years ago as well. And then we started saying, OK, well, now we're predicting things with feedback loops. And again, this is for executives, so bear with me. So we're counting things cleverly with feedback loops. Now we have machine learning. And then a couple of years ago, due to the you know, resurgence in the set of capabilities that deep learning was practically able to address, we started using the phrase AI again. Uh, Again, because it was the phrase we used up until the 90s when we rebranded into machine learning and stole a bunch of statistical practices. Um, but all of these things are not different. They are all built on the same stack. They are all related capabilities. And the point I want to make to this room with this slide is um, one thing, you can explain this to anyone. So, so go explain it to your executives. They'll get it. And number two is that you cannot do AI and machine learning and data science or data engineering without also being able to do analytics, without being able to even count things. Um, so if you're working in a space where you have a very poor analytical practice, it's very likely that trying to do anything else on top of that foundation will be more difficult than it should be. So let's do a thought experiment, because we have so many technologists in the room. And I expect you're going to spend the rest of the day thinking more about tech than about product and impact. So let's take some data set and imagine what you could build with it. So I'm going to start with the obvious, my favorite one, the weather. So if you had all of the weather data, and let's just assume someone had cleaned it up for you and you could query it in a pretty scalable way, what could you build with that data set that would not exist? And this is the kind of game that I play in the shower, so I'm hoping you all do too. What would you want to build? And we're literally in a room of 3,000 people, and you're all quiet. That is amazing. All right, so I will give you some answers. You could build uh, something like Dark Sky, a local weather prediction. Again, I love this app. They take your GPS location, make a prediction of, for where you're standing. I also expect you could combine it with other data. Why doesn't I already have a little thing that tells me whether I should take an umbrella when I leave the house? Um, why can't it tell me what to wear? Why can't it look at my calendar and say, oh, you have a few important meetings and it's going to rain on you, wear this outfit, this jacket, and by the way, bring a change of socks, or something like that. This is a really fun game. OK, so we can look at something like this. What sort of data products could you build from this? This is a bit of a trick question. But OK, so we could do all the fun things about demand, right? So if you have a network of soda machines, you could figure out where you need to reload, what the flavors are going to be. Um, you could start to engineer new flavors based on what people think. And you could multi-arm bandit test them to figure out who likes what. Um, 
But I actually chose this one because, uh, and this may be apocryphal, I don't know, if you Google uh, the, this headline or you Google like the first wired soda machine, uh, you'll find that um, the story goes that at Carnegie Mellon back in the 90s, the computer science department was far away from the soda machine and they were super lazy, so they wired the thing up. So it would uh, tell them when, when there was soda and how cold it was, so they would know whether it was worth the walk down there before they actually left the office. And now it's being held up as the first IoT device, um, which I really like, actually, uh, especially because the motivation was pure laziness, and yet it created this sort of useful data product. Um, and I'll show you this one, toothbrush. Maybe it could tell you where to brush so you don't miss spots. Maybe it could warn you when you should probably have, go get the dentist to look at something, who knows. Uh, someone is actually trying to build this, though they're trying to do it with a mobile app, not really with AI, so we'll see how that goes for them. Um, and now I'm gonna switch to uh, some more boring things. So uh, this is a call center. I didn't really have a packaged picture of a call center, but you can imagine a bunch of people on phones all day. Um, nobody likes calling a call center. How could we make it better? So this is an example uh, I've seen uh, several of our customers do, but I'll tell you about one bank. And what they did was really great because they took every phone call into their call center for a year. They did a speech to text uh, project. They clustered all of that text to figure out what people were calling about. They uh, had experts review those clusters. So this wasn't just you know, the nerds in the corner. That would be us saying, okay, we think this is it. They actually had the customer support folks involved. Um, they made a recommendation system. So they took all of the data about your transactions, your interactions with them through the app and other means. And when you call in now, they make a guess about what your, a prediction about what you're trying to call about and then suggestions for if this person is calling about X, you might try A or B to solve their problem. Um, or they let the customer service agent override it and say no, they were calling about this other thing, feeding more data back into the system that makes it better over time. It reduced call center costs by 2%. And you know in applied data science, you either have a tiny percentage improvement to a large scale problem or a order of magnitude improvement to a smaller problem to get an impact. This is the former. Um, and it improved customer experience because nobody, with a little star, because there are actually some weird people who call for companionship, but nobody likes calling the call center, right? It also saved them millions of dollars, which is important. Then they took that model that had been built and they were able to use it proactively. So if something happened where they predicted uh, you were going to be unhappy, they could send you an email and say, oh, hey, you overdrew your account. Here's how we'd like to handle it for you. Is that okay? Um, or whatever the case may be, right? This is a great data product. It is incredibly boring, but it actually has a positive impact for the business, and it has a positive impact on the customer experience. So I consider it a successful one. Another one I'll share from uh, one of our customers, which was a big auditing firm, um, and another rule of applied data products is first you have to get people to do a cost savings product before you can get them to invest in new revenue growth, uh, new product, right? So this is a visualization someone on our team made uh, of the US federal tax code, which I share here because we all, if you're an American, taxes were due a few weeks ago, so maybe it's still top of mind. And it's oddly beautiful. It looks sort of like these flowers, you know, taxes, roses, same kind of thing. Um, and what they did here was actually take guidance that had been issued in the past, which usually just goes in a memo in a drawer somewhere and gets forgotten, uh, take a JSON feed of changes to uh, the laws and also judicial interpretation that set new precedent for how those laws are going to be applied. And when there was a change in how something might uh, be impacted, they could reach out to the customer and say, you know, the guidance we issued you three years for that acquisition, which is still relevant in your tax treatment, should be updated. So this was a new revenue, new growth opportunity um, out of some, again, pretty boring data but effective. So these products are everywhere, and the opportunities to build them may surprise you. So I'm gonna ask another question, which is how many people here work at startups? All right, small, maybe 15%. How many people here work at sort of medium-sized companies? We'll say hundreds of employees. That is maybe the next half. And how many of you work at large companies? Many of you, okay, so you're gonna like this. 
because I think the opportunities for doing this work at large companies are underappreciated. And when you think about what you need to do this kind of impactful work with data science, it is really three things. So you need data. Startups don't have that. Uh, universities have to fight for it. You need context. So generally, you need someone who's been operating a business or an organization for some time who has a significant amount of expertise about what is useful and what is not useful. And you need the ability to plan in longer than six to 18 month cycles where you can plan one thing and then build on top of that and on top of that to eventually create a significant amount of value. Now, of course, there are a lot of forces working against you in large companies to do this effectively, which is largely the force of inertia, and this is the way we've always done this, and why do you want to change things, um, which is something you can overcome with good management, which I'll talk about briefly before I get into the tech part of this talk. Um, but I think that large companies are where a lot of this innovation is going to come from in the next few years. So why is this hard? Well. One of the challenges in this specific weird technical space is that you can't buy your way out of it. So in prior, uh, you know, in prior instances of this sort of tech becoming useful in a, a professional context, you could typically go buy it from somebody who could sell it to you, but that does not work in data science and machine learning. And it doesn't work because there's a version of your problem with your data in your specific context which is likely tractable for you to solve. But for somebody to sell you a solution, they have to solve a generic enough formulation of that problem that they can sell it to enough people to create a market. Does that make sense? Right? So this is a data product gap. You can't buy your way out of data science. So you have to build the capability inside your own organization. And furthermore, if you do buy your way out of it, you're putting yourself at a, a significant disadvantage because if you outsource this to some other company or some technical black box, you cannot build on top of it. You don't learn anything from the process of analyzing that data. I spent four years studying social media data 10 years ago, and I still have that uh, intuition where if I look at a graph of someone doing an analysis of Twitter data, I can tell you if it's wrong. Like the, the data you analyze leaves scars. Um, those things should be kept inside your company. That is a very useful uh, intuition and knowledge that you want to preserve. So my, my philosophical argument is that you cannot outsource this. You have to build it. Um, but it's hard because it's not like other technical changes. The technology is changing rapidly. The standards of practice are also changing. Um, by which I mean the way that we do our jobs as data scientists, software engineers, and data engineers around this space um, is changing. And I can prove this to you in the sense that if you're a software engineer working in traditional, let's say, SaaS type software, and you go from one job in one company to another job in another company, you more or less use the same tools, you're managed the same way, you've got an agile workflow, uh, you report up to the same part of the organization, your career path looks the same. Now, if you're a data scientist or an AI engineer or whatever your job title may be, this is the point, um, and you go from one company to another one, you have different expectations of what you do, you own a different piece of the workflow, your job description will be different, where you sit in the org will be different, um, and we've got a lot to figure out as a field, right? And I'll also say that experience is hard to come by because you've only been able to afford doing this for about a decade, so finding people who are good at it is a big challenge, and it's also why a lot of projects fail. And let's talk about what works this year. And this experience comes from my work uh, as the founder and CEO of Fastboard Labs, which was acquired into Cloudera. I now run Cloudera's machine learning business, including our software platform. For the nerds in the room, look at the Fastboard Labs blog, blog.fastboardlabs. And for everybody else, uh, we have a wonderful data management and data science platform for you. You can go look at our website at cloudera.com. That's my Cloudera commercial. Um, you need a bunch of pieces. So you need strategy, you need to think about the people, you need security, governance, and compliance, and of course you need technology, which I'll get to last. Strategy is, is really important, and doing this well is hard. So most companies will get a big group of people together, they'll all have ideas, none of them will be bad, and that is a bad sign. If you walk into a list of project proposals and none of them is even slightly risky, they're all obvious. Um, 
you need to change the way you do this work. So instead of a two-dimensional scatter plot with uh, value to business and cost to execute, uh, you should be thinking about some sort of n-dimensional model where the investment in one project, even if that project doesn't work out, will enable you to invest in other projects that become much cheaper because you've done the data cleaning work, you've done the prep work, someone has looked at that data, you understand where you're going. And again, this is different than planning IT and software engineering projects because you're not uh, starting out with an idea of what's possible and what's not, you're investing in a portfolio of capabilities. Um, and I wrote an article about this that some people at Harvard Business Review published, so if you want something to wave in people's faces, I recommend that. Um, you have to frame the problem carefully, and this is supposed to be an incompetent robot. Yes, and there it goes, okay. Or that's what happens. And I think folks in this room probably know this pretty well, but you need to do this at the beginning of the project. So you have to say, what is the problem we are actually trying to solve in plain language that everyone can understand? And you probably think that's easy to do, but it's actually really hard. Second, how do we know when we won? Or specifically, what are the error metrics by which we will evaluate our success? This is designed to keep folks from running off into a corner for four months and building some cool neural networks that are actually useless. Right? What are we going to do with this? What is the business case or the product case for investing in this particular project at this time? How much time is it worth to reduce the risk to understand if it's possible or not, if it'll work at a level of accuracy and quality that's useful to us? And then finally, what are the product user infrastructure concerns for the deployment of this? I can't tell you how many times I see someone build a really cool model and then hand it over the wall to their data engineering team to rewrite in Java and make it run fast. Um, this should be part of your design process from the beginning. And it's not hard, but it requires uh, discipline. And then from a management level, you have to think about where data, the data capability sits, how are they, those folks managed, how do you recruit them, what do their career paths look like, how do they work together effectively. And folks ask me all the time, well, where should I put my data scientists? I'm only going to hire a few or a small team, um, and I need them to do a lot of things. And so they can end up in any one of these places, right? So under the CFO, COO operating data, they can end up under a like IT CIO, they can end up wherever the product's being built, or they can be in R&D. These are all wrong. Um, if you're in operations and CFO land, you will only ever do business analytics. You will never impact the product or the business. If you're in CIO world, you'll have all the servers you need and probably a pretty nice relationship with your data engineering counterparts if you're lucky enough to have them. But the product people will not listen to you and you may end up in a situation where nothing makes it to production. Again, if you live in product, you may not have the ability to get the infrastructure you need to actually do your job. And if you're in innovation in R&D, you will likely build a ton of cool products prototypes but may not actually see anything have impact. So you see they are all wrong. However, each organization picks the one that is best for them at the moment. And sometimes if you're large enough and you have the resources, you can do hybrid models or federated models with centralized career paths. There are lots of options, but there's no one right answer. And that's why uh, everyone who does this well does it differently. Now, agile sounds good, um, but it fails. And it sounds good because in philosophy, it is the right approach for projects. Um, but in practice, there is no way to measure velocity on something that is much more science than it is engineering. Um, and this leads to a huge amount of wasted, wasted effort, frustrated data scientists, and lack of productivity. Um, so there are variations on Agile that work fine for data science. Again, I'm sure I'm going to open up Twitter and see uh, a bunch of examples. But uh, philosophy is right. The way it is practiced for software development does not copy and paste. And again, we have yet to figure out what that one right answer is for us. So let's do it. And everyone who does it well today does it differently. So let's make sure we're sharing to figure it out. I'm going to spend the last few minutes on uh, making one significant point about data products. And then I'm going to talk about tech because I can't believe I've given a whole talk and not even uh, gotten into the tech yet. I want to tell you a story I heard. Um, 
I was talking to the head of data science for an airline, and he told me that uh, they had built a model to predict how much fuel should go on the plane. And this is obviously one of those examples where a small improvement yields a huge amount of value. They're an airline, fuel is one of their biggest expenses. The model was much more accurate than what they'd been doing before, which was the pilot made up a number. Um, and, in, and, and they're good at it. I'm not saying they're not good at it, but it was better. But he said that uh, they initially rolled it out and all of the pilots would override it. They didn't like it. Um, and it turned out they didn't like it because they didn't trust it. They didn't know why the decisions were being made. And so they modified the product to actually tell the pilots why the decisions were being made. And then in this particular case, he said they didn't actually know. It was a black box model and nobody really, really knew. So what they did was they lied and they just printed out the weather and they said it was always the weather that indicated why uh, the recommendation was being made and that worked. So the point, I don't know if this is entirely true or not, but I love this story so much because it tells us that sometimes it's not the quality and accuracy of the math that we care about. It's how it's going to impact the people in their workflow who are ultimately going to use it. So if you are designing a model, you cannot forget about those people who will be using uh, your work. And there's a whole set of things to think about from a technical perspective as well. Do we have the right technology to actually take these workflows that I've been talking about and encode them in a process? And so if you think about the technology that underlies software engineering, um, and I know I'm talking about that a lot, but that's where I started my career. We have things like version control. We have things like reviewing pull requests. We have code reviews. We have both human and technology practices that have grown up to support those human practices. In data science, we have an emerging workflow, right? We develop model, or we get data from somewhere, we clean it, we develop models, we train models, we deploy them, we monitor and maintain them. Um, and then we need some way to manage all of this, especially as you go from having probably a handful of things in production to having potentially hundreds or even thousands of things in production. Um, but we are still developing the workflows and the tooling is emerging to support those workflows. Um, so it's a pretty exciting moment in technology as well. So predicting the future is hard, but I'm gonna try and do it a little bit um, to leave you with something uh, as we go off to the rest of the conference. These are postcards from the year 1900 from France trying to predict the year 2000. And I love them because they have nailed the problem statements, but the implementations are a little off. So on the left, we have automated farming. We, don't, we do have this today, but it's not wired. In the middle, we have what I'll call Wikipedia. So getting knowledge uh, into people's heads. Um, however, we don't have to wear weird bucket helmets and have some poor child turn a crank. And finally, we do in fact have technology for fighting fires. Um, in tall buildings, but they do not look like really cool, badass, old school wings, so you can fly up there um, and blow on it, whatever it is they're doing, right? So bear with me as I try to predict here. Hopefully I'll nail the problem statement. In five years or so, you can make fun of my, uh, my solution. Um, and everything I'm talking here comes from the Applied Machine Learning Research Group at Fast Forward Labs and our work with the broader community. So I don't think any of these things will be new ideas for this group, but they are the ones that we think are going to be particularly impactful in building products in the next few years. So the first one, we've already heard quite a bit about it this morning, is uh, the amount of work going into interpretability, that is being able to uh, essentially at an intuitive level permute inputs, look at how outputs change, and then understand statistical significance of particular features and making a recommendation. Um, here we looked at it in the context of a churn analysis for a telecom. This was a real customer problem we helped to solve. They had built a beautiful deep learning model that predicted that churn probability, but they did not know why. So this was to help explain it. And I'll just make the point that when you think about explainability, it's not just about ethics, it's also about making better decisions because you understand why things are being decided the way they are. And in this sort of model, you can go and change the features around and see how it impacts the eventual probabilities. So you can get a good uh, feel for, for what you can do with it. 
Another one I'll talk about is federated learning. This is uh, being able to do machine learning in some sort of edge context where for some reason you can't move the data to a central location to use our traditional process against it. Uh, this may be because the data is too big. So in an IoT type context where you have a very large stream um, of information and it's just impractical to move it, or it may be um, because of regulation. So if you're subject to GDPR, this is something you should care about, or it may be because you care deeply about preserving privacy. So if you're looking, say, at somebody's photos or somebody's voice data off their mobile device, perhaps you don't want to move that for privacy reasons to your server. Um, but you do want to benefit from being able to build machine learning models against that data. And federated learning is a set of techniques for doing exactly that. And we have a prototype you can play with um, that uh, demonstrates this in the context of a bunch of turbofans for predictive maintenance. Um, but again, it's just one particular flavor of this set of techniques. Um, this is something that I think will be very impactful on the way we think about designing and building machine learning products in the next few years. And if it's not, you can call me on it. And the last one uh, is thinking about the fact that many of us have data sets that we would like to use, but they are large and unlabeled. Um, so this is about active learning or typically human in the loop machine learning, though sometimes you end up in situations where you have a more expensive automated classifier. Um, and that is the, the, um, the calculation you're trying to make. But it's really figuring out in a world of samples where you can't afford to label all of them, which are the ones that you should invest in labeling for maximum information gain and quality of the resulting machine learning work. Um, there's a ton of attention that we all like to pay to work done on very large clean data sets or even just very large data sets, but the reality is that we don't always have those and we don't always have high quality labels. And as my friend Sean Taylor tweeted once, and I should have put this on a slide, he said, if you think human labelers are consistent and high quality, just go look in any public recycling bin and see. We're actually not that good at this. So this is a set of techniques for uh, making us better at this. Um, and I think it's one that will help us get more utility out of the data that we've generally already collected as a side effect of operating some other product or business. So make some all possible in a bunch of circumstances where it wasn't. OK, so a few uh, words of, of things to think about. We've had a lot about ethics this morning. Uh, usually I'm the only one who brings it up. Here's a free ebook that I wrote with DJ Patil, who was uh, Obama's chief data scientist, and Mike Lukides from O'Reilly about a year ago. It's very short and sweet, and again, is designed for practitioners. So for those of us who are sitting with our hands on a keyboard trying to make a decision about how to build systems that actually have a positive impact, um, Here's a set of things we think about. It covers some of what I talked about here. I think ethics is a scary word. What we're actually thinking about is more akin to the DevOps revolution in system administration, which was a set of technical and process changes that actually produced better outcomes. I think that's what we're really talking about here, is how do we have positive outcomes for the products we build and today, the practice that we have is still quite immature. We have a lot of opportunity as a community to improve it. And let's not just think about toothbrushes. Um, let's think about applying these things to build the products that will have the kinds of positive impact on the world that creates the world that we all want to live in. Right. And if we do this well, we are literally building ourselves superpowers in that we're able to build products that could not possibly exist without this technology that we as unaided humans could not build. And I could not be more excited to be working in this field today. Uh, it's been a really interesting 10 to 20 years, and I think the next 10 to 20 years will only continue to get more fun, um, more interesting, and to bring us uh, more uh, challenging problems to think about. And that is the end of my talk. So thank you very much, and thank you for your patience.